Thank you so much, guys and gal of Remedy. You have uh, blessed us this week. We appreciate it. We still got two more days to go, so it's not over yet. Hey, good to see you guys tonight. Good crowd, Pastor, for a, for a Monday night. So, wow, let's jump right overboard. What do you say? I want you to find your place with me in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 12. The book of Hebrews in my opinion, is one of the most intricate and skillfully composed books in all of the New Testament. The guy that penned this was nothing short of one smart, sharp, spirit-filled dude. Now, there's a lot of discussion today in scholarly circles about who was or who is the author of this book. It's one of the books in the New Testament that authorship is kind of unknown and contested. And um, if folk will listen to me, I'll tell them who wrote it. <laughs> My vote is for Apollos. Do you remember Apollos in the book of Acts? The Bible says that he was uh, mighty in the scriptures and whoever wrote this we can tell had a thorough thorough knowledge of the Old Testament we know that Apollos was also schooled in Alexandria in the north part of Africa and we know that that school in Alexandria developed what was known as Alexandrian logic and the book of Hebrews is filled with Alexandrian type of logical argumentation. So because of that, I throw my vote in for Apollos being the writer. Doesn't make a hill of beans who it was. All that matters is it's part of the inspired, inerrant, inerrant and infallible and powerful word of God. It challenges us, but it blesses us. So I want us to look at a portion of it tonight kind of analyze it and see how it can help us in our walk with Christ uh, right here in the Bible Belt of the United States of America some nearly 2,000 years after this guy penned it. Hey, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of God endures forever. It never goes out of style. It's just as relevant as if it were written yesterday for our particular circumstances that we are facing today. I agree with Vance Havner. One time he said, I'm so tired of hearing folk talk about preachers needing to make the Word of God relevant. He said, uh, the purpose of the Word of God is to show you how irrelevant your life is in comparison to it. And uh, I think he's right. Boy, this book certainly does that for us. It challenges us. But let's look at, uh, at this passage of Scripture beginning in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 12. This skillful and wise and smart writer says, Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed." Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. And there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. You know, I, I wish sometime that life was more user-friendly. I wish that life was a little bit more pain-free than it is. But I don't need to tell you that Pain and hurt is just a part of our lot as we trod through this fallen world in which we live. 
I mean, there's no way to escape it. You can live in a room that's padded with bubble wrap and you're still going to end up getting hurt somehow. If not physically, you're going to get hurt emotionally. Uh, you're going to get hurt spiritually. Somehow or another in this world, almost on a daily basis, you are confronted with the prospect of pain. And this passage of Scripture deals with just that. Notice how this passage unfolds because sometimes this guy writes and he thinks on a level that's on a different plane than what most of us think and operate linguistically and logically. So sometimes we have to really pay attention to the twists and turns of his grammar, his syntax, and the structure of how he composes things. So let's take a few notes before we really unfold this tonight so we can set it in its literary perspective. Notice the first word in chapter number uh, 12, verse number 12 is therefore. Now you know that when you see that, you need to look and see what is it therefore. And the first few verses in chapter number 12, uh, especially as we deal with verses 4 down through 11, if you have headings in your Bible, you see that it talks about the Father's discipline. And you know, here's the truth of the matter. As, as this writer unfolds this subject of pain and, and recovering from an injury in 12 through 17, here's what the therefore is there for. You are going to get hurt. And sometimes God will hurt you. Now let that sink in for a little while because sometimes we have this concept of God being an old, tender, grandfatherly gentleman that would never do anything but cause us peace and comfort and prosperity and happiness. But the therefore is there because sometimes God will break you. God will break you in His grace because the mold in which we are made is bent in the wrong direction. And sometimes the potter has to break us by His grace in order to reshape us. Hear me, this process of walking with Christ, being sanctified in the Spirit, is sometimes not all roses, is it? Sometimes it hurts Sometimes God in His grace does painful things in our life. But get this, He breaks us in order to make us better. He doesn't break us in order to destroy us, but He breaks us redemptively in order to make us more in the image of His Son. So here this passage teaches us first off that, you know, God is dangerous he is. If you walk with Him, there's going to be times when God, as a loving Father, will discipline you. And there are times when that is painful and it hurts us. But you know, there's other times when we are injured. Sometimes we injure ourselves, do we not? Sometimes we're our own worst enemy and some, sometimes the things that we do hurt our own self. And even worse than that is sometimes we are hurt by the people whom we love the most. Now sometimes it's malicious and sometimes it's absolutely without intent. It's unintentional. You know, David lamented. He said, Lord, when he was betrayed, he says, it wasn't one of my enemies who did this, but it was one with whom I used to eat. So sometimes the most painful injuries come from those who are the closest to us. Could be inadvertent. Could be they didn't even know it. But sometimes our family hurts us. Sometimes our friends hurt us. Sometimes our church hurts us. 
You know what I mean? It's impossible to have any meaningful relationship in this life that you are not sometime or another going to experience pain in that relationship and maybe even be hurt because of that relationship. Pain is just part of our lot in this life. Hey, if you're looking for the perfect church, a church where you can go and you can open your heart and never be hurt, I hate to tell you, you're not going to find that church. We're going to be hurt in the process of walking with Christ. That's all there is to it. Now, here's the old adage, you can't control what happens to you sometimes. But you can control what you do with what happens to you. And you see, this is what this passage is all about. So I want to speak to you tonight on recovering from an injury. And I don't have to worry about, is there anybody here that's ever been hurt before? Is there anybody here tonight that's dealing with the pain of an injury from a relationship because every one of us have been and will be, if we are not right now, hurt in a very close relationship. Maybe the Lord, maybe family or friends, maybe the church. Maybe I have hurt somebody without knowing it. I hate that, but that's just a part of life. We're going to do it. Not only have you been hurt, but you've hurt somebody. It's the cold facts of the matter. So how is it that we can live this life that's filled with pain, hardship, and injury, even in the most intimate of relationship, and survive without becoming bitter over those types of injuries? Well, you see, a lot of revival is about this very type of thing. Because before God can use you, He's got to heal you. Because you see, when you're hurt, there are some things you cannot do. Notice what this writer says. He says in verse 13, Make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. You know, what he's saying here is if you've got a sprained ACL or MCL, you don't want to be making quick pivot plants on that knee until it is healed because you're going to blow it out and really hurt yourself. If you're hurt, there are some things that you cannot and should not do. And here is my fear. My fear is we are trying to win this world with a bunch of wounded soldiers. And you know, you can't be victorious if your army is lame, if your army is injured. And one of the things we do at the Baptist College of Florida, and certainly one of the things we do as a mission agency, when we have candidates for ministry, we focus a lot on them. It's not on what's all out there that God's calling you to do. We want to get into your life for a minute. And we want to know about who you are and what road you've traveled and what injuries you have and what wounds are you still nursing and what old grudges are you, you still holding on to and those types of things because if you are injured, you can't help rescue anybody else. You see, when I was a firefighter before God called me to preach in Gulfport, Mississippi, one of the things they used to teach us is that a rescuer who needs rescuing is no good on the fire ground. So in other words, don't put yourself in a position where you're going to need to be rescued yourself. And that's, that applies spiritually. I'm afraid we're trying to have revival with people who've been hurt. And it just can't happen. See, let's, let's compare it a little bit to the physical realm. When you're hurt, there's some things you just can't do. When you're injured, there's some things you just can't do. When you're sick, there's some things you can't do until you get better. 
I don't know how long ago it was, a couple of years ago. Do y'all remember when the, when the Zika virus was the big scare? I mean, it was all over the news. And you know where that Zika virus was. You know where, where it was centrally located, don't you? Brazil. Guess who was living in Brazil? You know it. Well, when Zika started bursting on the scene, I told my wife, I said, I'm headed straight for it. I know it. I just know I am. <laughs> uh, because normally when something like that comes up, guess who gets it? If anybody in our organization is going to get it, I'm going to be the guy to get it. The Brazilians call me a cold foot. They say, I'm a pet for you. That's somebody who has bad luck. <laughs> Everything that goes wrong is going to end up somehow or another with me. And they just laugh and laugh and laugh. We have a big time about it. You know, I'm the one guy in 10,000. If something goes wrong, it's going to go, oh, no, Pastor, that never happens. Guess who it will happen to? It happens to me. So I said, I'm going to get Zika. Sure enough, I got that Zika virus. And it was one of the most strange illnesses I ever had. I mean, I would burn up with a fever, turn beet red, have big splotches all over my body every day at 3 p.m., every day. And I would suffer and I would sweat and I'd do everything I could to try to calm down. We're in the equatorial heat, you know, and uh, it's already 110 outside. Now I got 103 fever. And we'd get that thing broke. I'd sweat it out by about 10 o'clock. I'd wake up next morning feeling fine. Woo, we're good to go. Three o'clock rolls around, here it comes. So we knew there for about two weeks, whatever I did in the morning by three o'clock, I better be somewhere where I could hunker down because it was about to hit me. Well, that rocked on, rocked on. This is what the doctors told me. The doctor said, listen here, because men are horrible at taking medical advice, right? You know what I'm saying? The only way you can recover from an injury, or from that illness is to follow medical advice. So Heather and I were coming stateside, and this is what some of the docs said. They said, you're going to start feeling real good in about two weeks. But they said, look at me, preacher. Just because you're feeling good don't mean you're over this. You can't do anything strenuous for two weeks after your last symptom has disappeared. I said, okay. You know, I mean, you got to tell them okay or they won't let you leave the office. I said, got you. We got home and one of my neighbors, there's a little blow come through and he had a tree down in his yard and he was 80 something years old and he was trying to clean it up. I said, ah, so I went and got my chainsaw and went down there and cut it up for him. Uh, it was hot, it was July. And cut that tree up and guess what happened at 3 o'clock that day? It all came right back. And it all came back because preacher didn't follow medical orders. They told me, they said, there, there's some things that you better not do and you cannot do until this has cleared your system for a long time. And I didn't believe them. But you see, when you hurt, there are just some things you can't do. And, 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 and be victorious in the army of the Lord is one of them. Having revival with a bunch of hurt people is one of the things we can't do. We can't send missionaries who've been hurt until we can deal with all that pain in their life. So let's deal with a little pain from Hebrews chapter number 12. How do you recover from one of those debilitating, painful injuries that even comes from people who are close? Well, watch what this writer does. And it seems like all of these rapid-fire commands he gives here are kind of unrelated, but they're really not. He really lays a trail for us, and he gives us spiritual medical advice on how to get over an injury. And notice what he says. They're, 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 the doctor gives us four orders here in the form of some imperative verbs. Notice what he tells us first in verse number 14. This is how he says that we are to be healed. Because that's his last word in verse number 13. Here it is. Verses 14 through 17 intricately related to 12 and 13. 12 and 13 related to 5 or 4 through 11. So here's what he says in verse 14. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Doctors order number one to recovery to recover from an injury. This is what he says we must do. We must see the invisible. We must see the invisible. Now look how he does. He gives us two commands, and then at the end of those commands, he kind of gives us the reason why. 
He gives us a summary statement, so to speak. And here it is in the end of that verse. Without which no one will see the Lord. You see, here's what he's saying. He's saying if you've been hurt, and he said you want to get over it, you must have the ability to see the invisible, namely the Lord. You see, Paul tells us, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We look to the things which aren't seen, which aren't seen, while the world looks to the things which are seen. You know the Lord and that spiritual realm is invisible, but I want to tell you, if you've been born again, He has given you the ability to see Him and see His kingdom and see His work and know what He's doing around you. That's why Jesus said this in John chapter 3 when He was talking to Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about going to heaven when you die. He's talking about what God is doing around you. You see, lost people do not have the ability to see the invisible realm. They don't have the ability to see God. But that is part and parcel of what happens when a person is born again. All of a sudden, our spiritual vision comes alive. All of a sudden, we can hear now from God. We can see Him, and we can align our lives with Him and move towards Him. And he tells us here that if we're going to recover from an injury, the first order he gives us is that we must be able to see the Lord. Can I ask you a question? How have you seen the Lord at work in your life today? I have some, some close friends who just are saturated with the remarkable ability to see God in almost any and every circumstance. Some of those people are tremendously valuable to me as it relates to giving counsel and guidance and spiritual advice because they have cultivated the ability to see God. And I want to tell you, there's no, be no greater blessing in the world than to be able to see the invisible. Now, look how, look how he tells us that we are to do this. He tells us that we are to do this by, number one, pursuing peace. Here's the imperative. He says, pursue peace with all men. You know, that's, that's who we are as the people of God. Are we not? We should be people of peace primarily. I mean, our Savior is known as the Prince of Peace. He tells us to pursue peace with all men. And then look what he says next. And the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See that word sanctification? Just a big fancy word for, for holy or holiness. So here's what he's saying to us. He is saying that peace is the environment in which holiness grows. Holiness will never grow in an atmosphere of conflict. If you are a person that is just drawn to the controversial, if you're a person with an argumentative spirit, if you're a person who is disagreeable with almost everything, I can guarantee you, you will never be a holy person. Because what he's telling us here is that holiness grows in the environment of peace. If you're not at peace with God, you will never develop a sanctified lifestyle. If you're not at peace with those around you, you will never live in holiness because peace is the environment in which holiness grows. Now, I want you to, if you're taking notes tonight, I want you to move away from my outline as I, I, I'm talking about the recovery or recovering from an illness. And the first order he gives us is see the invisible. Move over to the side, and I want you to make two columns. Because I want to show you how he gives us two alternative paths that we can follow after we've been injured. One of them leads to a good place. The other one doesn't. And each one of these verses gives us another component, another step down that road after we've been hurt. So here you go. Uh, on the left-hand column, as you make two columns, I'm going to give you this or that. Put, put one on one side and one on the other. 
Here's your choice after you've been injured. Are you ready? Choice number one, peace or conflict. After you've been hurt, you can choose to have peace with that person who injured you, peace with God, or whatever, or you can choose to have battle. You can choose to fight it out. You can choose in the flesh, hey, you hurt me, I'm going to get even with you. That's our two options here. That's why he says pursue peace. He don't even talk about conflict, that's just the opposite. You, nobody has to be schooled in conflict. We all know how to do that. He, 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 he encourages us against it and he says pursue peace. So step number one, your choice after you've been hurt, you can choose peace or you can choose conflict. Step number two, under those two in the same column write this. You can choose holiness or you can choose sin. You can choose to respond to this out of a lifestyle that's sanctified in the Holy Spirit or you can choose to handle it in the flesh in a sinful way. That's why he says, pursue peace and the holiness or the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Okay? So here are the first two steps on two paths. you got one path in the right-hand column, one path in the left-hand column, and we're going down. First, peace or conflict. Second, holiness or sin. The third step down that path is vision or blindness. Do you see how we're progressing? You see the progression as we go farther down these paths? down these columns that we're putting on our paper. You can either have vision through, the, through pursuing peace and holiness or you can have blindness by choosing conflict and sin. The farther down the path we go, the more detrimental the consequences become for the believer. And you know, this is really the heart of it right here. If the devil can put your vision out, he knows he can take care of you. And you know, that's what he's after. He wants to blind you spiritually. Because a warrior in the Christian camp that's blind is absolutely harmless to him and his kingdom of darkness and his army of demons. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to put your vision out. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul said something in the book of Ephesians chapter number 6 this is what he says he says for we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood now that word wrestle is very interesting in the original language what it describes is a wrestling match that the Romans had back in the first century and prior and in their wrestling matches this is what they would do they would have sometimes two big old husky gladiators and everybody would fill the Colosseum to watch these wrestling matches. And there was a judge, but it wasn't like WWF where the guy got down and went one, two, and the guy would pick his shoulder. None of that stuff. We're talking about wrestling for keeps. The judge was set up on an, on an exalted podium, kind of like the referee at a tennis match. And these guys would just beat one another senseless. And whoever was the victor would eventually get on top of the one whom he had pinned and beaten. He'd put his knee in his chest. And he would look up at that judge who was seated on the platform and if the judge gave him the thumbs up sign then what the victor would do is take his two fingers and he would gouge the eyes of his opponent out. So if you lose this wrestling match at the very least you are leaving blinded for life. And you see that's why Paul says this is not fun and games. We're not just playing here. This is not a picnic. This is for real. The devil, through sin, wants to put your spiritual vision out and cause you to be spiritually blind. And it's no wonder that I hear folk today say things like, well, I just don't see the need in being at church more than once a month. I just don't see the need, Pastor Michael, of sending missionaries to places where they've never heard the gospel when we've got lost people right here. I just don't see the need of being faithful with my time. You know why you don't see it? I can tell you why. Because the devil took you to the mat and he's put your spiritual vision out. So the choice here, peace or conflict, 
holiness or sin, vision or blindness. Recovering from an injury, step number one, you must be able to see the invisible. Step number two, you must be able to do the impossible. (laughs) Do the impossible. Now what is that? Well, look with me in verse number 15. He says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up and causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. You know what is impossible here? Listen, remember, we're talking about in the context of being hurt by somebody whom you love, somebody very close to you. They injured you. They hurt your heart. Now, you know what's impossible to do, humanly speaking? Forgive that person. It's almost impossible from a human perspective to forgive that person and say, I choose to let it go. See, from a human perspective, what we want to say is, I want to get even. Hey, you don't do that to me, son. Get away with it. I'll get you. When you least expect it, you better be watching out because I'll get you. And you see, that is unacceptable for a believer. Because when that takes place, we're, 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 we're doing just what this writer talks about when he says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. You know, that word short of the grace of God, it, it doesn't mean that the grace of God is out there and we're right here and we fell down before we got to grace. What it means is like the other day I was filling up, uh, pumping fuel into one of my uh, pieces of equipment. The guy that was pumping said, how much you want me to put in it? I said, stop just short of it overflowing. That's what this is talking about. You see, he's talking about, see to it that no one comes short of a full tank of the grace of God. Because that's the only way you can respond in grace is if you are full of grace. And you see, grace is the basis of our relationship with God. It's what God did for us that we didn't deserve and couldn't do for ourselves. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. And we're to be filled with God's grace. And you know what happens when you're full of something? Hey, I got a a brand new tube of toothpaste at home. It's full. And you know what happens when I get up in the morning and I put pressure on the outside of that toothpaste tube? Guess what comes out? Diesel fuel? No. What it's full of? Toothpaste. And you see, that's what he's talking about. When you're hurt... That is some, the circumstances of life putting pressure on you from the outside. And have you ever noticed when you squeeze something, what comes out is what was on the inside. So if you're full of grace and somebody hurts you, you don't respond by getting even. You respond in the same manner that God responds to us when we sin against Him and He has the right to thump us on the head But many times he don't, he responds to us in grace. When you have received grace, you are more likely to respond in grace. And that's what he's saying. That's what's impossible. From a human perspective, we don't operate like that. But that's what's so supernatural about this Christian life. We respond in grace. So he says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. And here's the purpose clause. Why do you have to be filled with grace? So that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. The root of bitterness. It's an agricultural term. Hey, you know how you handle weeds? Not by taking a lawnmower and mowing them down. They'll just come right back. You got to get the root. If not, it's going to come back. And when that root of bitterness takes hold in our heart, you know, we're good at manicuring it and making it look good on Sundays when we come to church. But Monday you get back out there and that thing flares right back up. He says, be careful that no root of bitterness springing up, and look what it does. A root of bitterness will always cause trouble. It'll cause trouble for you. It'll cause trouble for those around you. It's going to add to your frustration. You've been hurt and now you're bitter over it. And you can't get over it. You can't move on. I talk to people and they bring up stuff that happened to them at church 20 years ago and the emotion is just as raw today as if it happened yesterday. 
and they're bitter, bitter, bitter people because of it. You know why? Because they went down the wrong path in dealing with an injury. You know, people always use this phrase, well, he's just a bitter old person. You know what I find out? You know what I find about bitter old people? Is that they were once bitter young people. Am I right? I mean, you just don't wake up one morning and you're bitter. I mean, that root of bitterness has been growing in your heart for so long. And I'm telling you, I know people that are so bitter that I avoid them, Pastor Mike. I do. Because when you get around them, the only thing they're going to spew out is negativity and pessimism and criticism and all of that kind of stuff. And it'll drag you down. Because that root of bitterness causing trouble. Look what else he says. He says, and by it many are defiled. Many. One bitter person can defile a whole company of others. It's amazing how bitterness spreads and holiness seems to stay contained within us. Bitterness spread like wildfire and defile many. And can I say this to you? Man, I'm tired of hearing folks say things like this. I'm tired of hearing folks say, you know, the church is the only institution in the world that shoots its injured. No, we don't. We don't kill our injured. But I can tell you what, we do have a reasonable expectation that if you're injured, you're going to get better. Because you are a forgiven, sanctified, spirit-filled, blood-bought, born-again child of the King. By golly, you have the ability and the resources to get better. You do. And here's what the devil knows. The devil knows if he can keep that root of bitterness growing in your heart, he knows that not only will he take you out of the battle, but he'll take ten other soldiers along with you out of the battle. You know why? Hey, we got folk been hurt 20 years ago, and they're still expecting us to hold their hand over it. We ain't going to do it. The battle is too important. There's too much at stake to hold the hand of a whiny snot-nosed baby Christian who can't get over something that happened years ago when it should be have been dealt with in grace and gone. I talked to a man who fought in one of our wars and he's told me this. He said, you know, he said the strategy of our enemy at one time, they weren't trying to kill Marines. They were just trying to injure Marines because they knew if they could injure one Marine they would take four off the front line to carry him back to safety. And that's the same thing this guy's talking about. If the devil can make one of you bitter, he knows that he'll take ten more of you out as you try to get that person over that bitterness for the next 15 years, holding their hand and pacifying them. And I'm here to tell you, this guy says, you can't do that. you got to get better. You have got to get better. And the way you get better is by seeing the invisible and by doing the impossible. That is forgiving by the grace of God supernaturally. Hey, let me tell you what bitterness is like. You know, most church signs are are ridiculous, aren't they? (laughs) Sometimes I take a shot of them, just use them as an illustration because their theology is so bad, Pastor Mike. (laughs) But I saw a church sign the other day and this is what it said. It said... Being bitter is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. I thought, boy, that's it. You go ahead and be bitter all you want because somebody hurt you 20 years ago and I promise you they are living a happy life today. Your bitterness ain't bothering them one bit. But you know what it's doing to you? It's killing you. It's eating you alive It's robbing you of the joy of Christ. It's robbing you of victory in Jesus. It's robbing you of all of those things. So here we go, back to our our path, our steps down the path, down this column. You ready? Here's the next step down the path. You can choose forgiveness or you can choose bitterness. There's no other option here. There's no middle road. The next step down this path, on one side is forgiveness, on the other side is bitterness. So recovering from an injury, number one, he says you must be able to see the invisible. 
Number two, you must do the impossible. And number three, he says you must distance yourself from immorality. Distance yourself from immorality. Now look what he says in verse number 16. Same see to it controls this, sen- or this, this portion of the sentence. See to it that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. This is still in the context of recovering from that injury, remember? And he says that we must distance ourselves from immorality. Now, let me stop right there with you a minute. Put it on pause. What is the only sin that we associate the word immorality with? Come on. Sexual. It's always sexual. But look at this word. The word just means immoral. It means anything that is contrary to the moral fiber of Almighty God. You see, morality comes from God. So anything that's against the nature of God, biblically speaking, is immoral. Now, let me prove this to you. Here's the man Esau. He, he says, see to it that there be no immoral person like Esau. Do you know there's not one place in Scripture, search the Old Testament in regards to Esau. There's not one place in the Old Testament that associates Esau with sexual immorality. So he redefines the word immorality here. Look what he says. Immorality to this writer is not having illicit sex outside of marriage. Immorality for this smart and wise and spirit-filled writer is a godless person who would sell his own birthright for a single meal. This is how he describes someone who is immoral. It's somebody who puts their carnal and fleshly appetites above spiritual priorities. Doesn't have to be sex. For him it was hunger. He was hungry. And he put all of the spiritual priorities that God had established aside for a single meal. Hey, for one salad, he sold his spiritual birthright. So an immoral person, in this writer's perspective, not somebody who is a womanizer, not somebody who's caught up into intellectual Uh, 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 illicit sexual schemes it's somebody who simply obeys their carnal desires more readily than they do their spiritual impulses so as we go down this column here's the next step in the left hand column when you've been hurt he says distance yourself from immorality remember how he redefined it so here's your choices you only got two choices number one purity or immorality purity or immorality now back to our outline recovering from an injury number one see the invisible number two do the impossible number three distance yourself from immorality and finally in the last verse this is what this is the principle he gives us avoid the inescapable avoid the inescapable Look what he says in verse number 17. Because here's the end result, ladies and gentlemen. If we don't recover from this injury, if we nurse this thing, if we bring it up every day, if we remind ourselves how wrong we were done, here's where you're going to end up. He says, avoid this destination. Avoid it at all cost. Verse 17. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. My goodness. We recently had a theological debate in Graceville, Florida. And here it was. Here's the question that the theological debate was over. Is it possible for a person to go so far that they cannot return. And this is one of the primary texts that's used in the pro side of that argument. Is it possible 
Well, let's look at what this writer says. Look what he says. He says, you know that even after he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. And why was he rejected? Well, he says, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. Get this, I want you to hear me good. One of the greatest lies that Satan tells is, hey, listen, you don't have to do this tonight. I know he's speaking to you, but you don't need to repent tonight and put this in God's hands. You go home, pray about it for a little while, and maybe you'll be prepared. You can do this Sunday or, or the next time. Hey, you can repent anytime you want is what the devil says. Can I say to you, that is just what it is, a lie from hell. You know when you repent? You repent when God grants you the opportunity to repent. That's when you repent. That's biblical. That's what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, that God might grant repentance. And look at this verse. Look what he says. He found no place for repentance. That, that word place there, uh, no physical place, no literal place for repentance. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of Brazil. Because here's what we find in Brazil. Man, I love to drive in Brazil. In Brazil, you drive with emotion. I mean, literally, if you, if you can't pass somebody on the road, you get up on the sidewalk and pass them <laughs> at 50 miles an hour. I mean, that's just the rules. That's just the way it is in Brazil. I mean, my goodness, I love it. It's exhilarating. And then I come home to Dothan. <laughs> and I get behind the worst, dri worst drivers in the southeast. Y'all know what I'm talking about? No, I'm not talking about y'all. I'm talking about people in Dothan. Huh? I, I, boy, there's some sinners over there, right? Amen. <laughs> they don't know how to drive. But here's one of the things in Brazil that drives me crazy. Oh, I love the emotion of the driving over there. I love it. I can't, when I got home not long ago, I had one of my friends in the truck with me. When I, was, I, I forgot I was back in the U.S. He said, brother, you're not in Brazil anymore. <laughs> we were getting it. I'm glad the police didn't see me doing that. But nonetheless, you drive with emotion over there. But here's one of the things. There is no such thing as a left turn in Brazil. By golly, if you want to go left, you got to make a right, a right, a right, and then get there. It's like, it's like left turns are against their religion. I don't understand it. And some of the places there in the city where, where we work, you know, it's, it's, it's four lanes, and we can be going down the road, heading out, and there's the place we want to go right there. It's right there. If there were just a crossover right here, I mean, I'm right there. And I'm thinking about jumping the curb and, and moving donkeys and carts and everything and just getting there. But you know what I have to do? I have to drive sometimes another 10, 15, 20 minutes before I find a turnaround <laughs> to come back to get to the place that I could have spit on out the window. <laughs> but I, there was no left-hand turn. And that's what this writer's talking about. He says, you know what? He says, you keep going down this path, and you keep going down this path, and before long, there's no left-hand turn. You might want to, but there's no place to turn around. And it's almost as the Spirit of God has said, my spirit will not always strive with you. Now I'm leaving you in your own devices, and my judgment upon you is that you live this miserable existence which you chose by ignoring my grace and ignoring my word and choosing the wrong path your entire life, though I begged you not to. Wow. That's when people die bitter old folks. They may have wanted to change, but they found no place for repentance. Here's the last step, the last choice. Freedom or spiritual bondage. You see, because you're in spiritual bondage when there's no place for repentance. You can't get out of it. The cycle has got you. You are on a treadmill and you can't get off of it. The only thing you can do is keep plodding down that same path that you chose years ago. But son, freedom is on the other side of the road. Then you are free in Christ. Jesus said, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now let's walk down these two paths one time and I'm done. On the one side of the road, there is what? There is peace, there's holiness, there's vision, there is forgiveness, there's purity, 
and there is freedom. But if you make the wrong choice, the other side of that road looks like this. It looks like conflict. The next step is sin. The next step is blindness. The next step is bitterness. The next step is immorality. And the next step is spiritual bondage. You are locked on a pathway that you cannot get off of. What a miserable, miserable person that would be. In Jesus' name, let the grace of God well up within your heart. Uproot that root of bitterness. Do the impossible and forgive in order that you get on the right path. Hey, if God's spoken to you, there's a left-hand turn available tonight. Who knows, if you pass up this opportunity to make a left-hand turn and repent, there may not be another one. You may pass this opportunity up and it never come up again. And you're on the treadmill for the rest of your life. If God's spoken to you. Take my advice. It's no fun to be bitter. Would you stand with me, please? Father in heaven, thank you for your word. God, we realize that it's impossible to live this life without pain, without injury. It's just part of our lot in this fallen world. It's just part of our lot as sinners. But God, we thank you that you give us the supernatural ability because we've been born again to be filled with your grace in order not to stay there. I mean, it's no disgrace to be there, but it is a disgrace to stay there. So I pray, God, tonight as I am preaching to a room full of people who have been hurt, to people who have hurt others ourselves, I pray, God, tonight we will heed the voice of the Spirit calling us to the right path so that we'll be free, so that we'll be useful, so that the things that you have before us to do, we can do it because we're whole, because we're complete, because we're not injured, because we're not sick, because we're not lame. So God, would you put us on that path tonight through repentance. Use us for your glory as workmen who need not be ashamed, as warriors for Christ in this life, on this battlefield. And we pray it in Jesus' name.